relationship between people and wildlife has always existed. And this is what I think we are losing as a society, the connection with our natural environment. Since Darwin in 1830, he reported with several expeditions the relationship between people and, and their wildlife. He encountered uh, indigenous people in, that, in the most amazing areas of South America, and he reported the relationship they have with this magnificent uh, fauna up there. Nowadays, indigenous people are still fighting for their rights on their land. They are fighting, they are looking, they are exploring the ways to visible, to fight for something they think it belongs to them. Uh, normally, the areas they are claiming are rich in biodiversity. And these areas have enough natural resource for their subsistence too. So this uh, combination of indigenous people and biodiversity rich countries is a common pattern in Latin America. The way people are claiming for their right, it's marching, it's trying to be visible, as I said. Uh, but I am here to tell you uh, an example of a partnership between indigenous people and scientists. Scientists who believe that it was time to pay attention to other parts of, of uh, South America, or other biomes. They have, both have different um, objectives, different interests on the land they were fighting for. Indigenous were not conservationists. Uh, and both of them knew and respect their positions. But they have an uh, a common objective. They wanted to stop the advancement of agricultural development on the greatest Grand Chaco, the South American Grand Chaco. This biome is the second largest biome after the Amazon. It is one million square kilometers and is shared by four countries, Bolivia, Brazil, uh, Paraguay, and Argentina. Thanks to this partnership, to the, to the effort between people and scientists, at 3.4 million hectares were declared protected areas in Bolivia. And with this, we are protecting the largest and less fragmented part of expanse of tropical dry forest in the world. Just on time, because after uh, this area was declared protected, scientists had the time to go and to explore what was in. And, and we discover and we confirm what indigenous people already knew. The incredible biodiversity, the Chaco was hidden. We found one of the healthiest populations of jaguars in South America. Uh, Brazilians didn't want to believe that, but it was true. Uh, we, we reported uh, 13 uh, species of armadillos, ranging from 300 grams to 30 kilos. We reported the third wild peccary in South America. Uh, it was thought to be extinct in the 80s. Um, and, and also we were able to, to study uh, reproductions of different species. Uh, the Chaco, as a region, have 3,400 plant species and counting. And 400 of these species are endemic to the area. Uh, more than 500 uh, species of birds, uh, 150 species of, of uh, mammals, and counting. So it's, um, it's, it's really um, uh, an area that deserves attention. And it's been uh, destroyed in the last decade. There you also have people that use these resources for subsistence. For more than 10 years, we were able to study the wildlife in this, in this Grand Chaco. Um, we, we produced several uh, scientific papers. We were able to have our degrees from studying in the, in the Grand Chaco. We discovered several things. We were learning a lot. Um, 
we were contributing to the better understanding of this beautiful and, and very rich area. But we were, we were not alone. We were with a team of local people, indigenous people, who guide us in the process. So for more than 10 years, they were involved with us in the effort of research. But what is next for them after this fantastic project ended? After exposing them for more than 10 years to research, to the word conservation, to the, to the word subsistence, what was next? To these people who really contributed to the better understanding of wildlife in this area. I obtained my, my doctoral degree. I was very happy. Many people were very happy. And we, we were very successful uh, producing papers. But it was something wrong there. So in 2007, I developed a project. And my intention was to not let them alone after the project. So I developed the parabiologist training course and the parabiologists in terms of paramedics. They are ready to save life, to take decisions in the, in the right moment. So they are capable. And this is what I wanted to show everybody. They are capable to do things. We um, choose an area where we, we have this, the, uh, one of the most endangered species in, in Bolivia, a mammal species, the guanaco. Uh, we only have two, uh, around 200 individuals in the whole country. And, and it's a really good situation to teach people who really want to face the challenge of conservation. So you have to deal with everything, with borders, international borders, military people, drug traffickers. Um, you know, you, you have these uh, ecological problems. You have, um, you have to deal with many, many different actors. So it was a great place to, to expose these, these people and to, to um, uh, train them uh, as a conservationist there. So for uh, more than eight months, they had 800 hours of practical and theoretical training. This is more than a master's degree. And they have to study from basic biology. They study all the methodologies biologists use. They also had a veterinary uh, module because I wanted them to identify diseases in wildlife. But what was important for me, not only um, help them to, to take the best data, but what was important was they understand why they were taking the data, why they were helping biologists, why these data were important. So they had to learn how to analyze the data, and even more, how to uh, present the result of the data. So for me, this was a step forward for their education. At the end, we also contributed to the better understanding of the situation of the Guanaco population in the area. Uh, we were able to have 30 hours of aerial surveys, and each parabiologist had the experience. And for them, it was magic to see the world from the sky. They, they never had that experience. So after a lot of effort, after 800, 800 hours of, of training, uh, they finally obtained their certificate. And after a huge fight with many people, we have the certificate validated by the Ministry of Education of the country. So this is a big thing for us. Thanks to this experience, uh, the Rolex Award um, is helping with uh, a grant. And we are expanding. We want to cross borders. We think that the protection of the Grand Chaco doesn't have to stay just in one country, because you know, it's, it's a huge biome shared by different countries. So we have to work together. And this is my idea. One of the, the, the ways to do it is to train 
parabiologists, indigenous people in these other countries. And we just finished the second training course, and this time was international. And this time, the graduated parabiologists were the teachers to the new parabiologists. So they are discovering the, the feeling they, they can teach others. And it is great because they, they um, share the same language. So communication is better. But it's not about the title. It's, it's not about uh, the certification of the knowledge of these indigenous people. They are capable. Nobody sometimes wants to recognize that, but they are capable. They are intelligent. And they know a lot about the, their environment. It's not about the title. It's about the pride they feel when they, they know they are capable to do it. And it's about the contribution these people can make in long-term conservation of nature. So it's my way to explore and to find some, some ways to, to, to connect, to recon reconnect options for people and nature. Thank you. <laughs>